Well, thank you very much, Mr. Glover, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here and uh, allowing your minds to be addressed or addressing your minds to what is really quite an important subject in the present time. What I hope to do um, this evening is to share some thoughts with you about economics in a larger context than is often the context for considering economics. And I hope you'll understand that uh, it is, to some extent, a work in progress. And anything that I say this evening may be changed next week. <laughs> <clears throat> Which is a longer time scale than our Parliament seems to be able to figure uh, just at the moment. Um, but the idea is to share some thoughts. And it's uh, based on uh, an idea that um, emerged quite recently, which was what happens if you start to look at the whole area of economics from the point of view of the philosophy of unity. And the reason for doing that is that the school, over many years, has come to know and love and understand uh, a philosophy which can be described quite well as a philosophy of unity, and which is uh, designed, I think, and intended to enable human beings to lead full lives while coming to a full and deep appreciation of who and what they are as human beings. Uh, and hence, in a way, the title, Being Human, Economics and Human Nature in Our Time. And you will have seen the um, little comment afterwards. How we view ourselves as human beings has a direct bearing on how we live our lives and arrange our economies. So what does it mean to be human? What is the human place in the natural world? How can answers to these questions affect economic life in the modern world? Um, this is a, a, a lecture on economics. And um, one of the great economists of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, once observed, I'm sure that the power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. Uh, I happen to think that was an accurate observation. And ideas is really what, what this evening is all about. The ideas that we have, the ideas that govern us and the communities we live on, in, and possibly how they might change. Uh, this comes with a warning um, summed up by an Irish politician of, I think, the 19th century called John Corrie, who said, beware of people who moralise about great issues. Moralising is easier than facing hard facts. Um, I, I think that's right, uh, and uh, I'm aware of the danger, but I'm not sure that I will be able to escape it. But I'm going to try, um, at least to start by looking at some hard facts. Uh, now, I think um, one of the problems um, with looking at hard facts and with the general need, I suppose, certainly uh, fashion in giving any sort of talk, that before you start proposing solutions, you have to outline the problem that you're trying to address. I think this is why economics has come to be known as the dismal science. Because if you look at some of the hard facts, um, it doesn't look very attractive. This is a short extract from uh, an article that appeared in the Huffington Post this week. Um, it's by a man called John Vidal. And it says this. Nature is in free fall. And the planet's support systems are so stretched that we face widespread species extinctions and mass human migration unless urgent action is taken. That's the warning hundreds of scientists are preparing to give, and it's stark. Hence the dismal science. The last year has seen a slew of brutal and terrifying warnings about the threat climate change poses to life far less talked about, but just as dangerous, if not more so, is the rapid decline of the natural world. 
the felling of forests, the over-exploitation of seas and soils, and the pollution of air and water are together driving the world to the brink, according to a huge three-year United Nations-backed landmark survey to be published in May. The study will show how tens of thousands of species are at high risk of extinction, how countries are using nature at a rate that far exceeds its ability to renew itself, and how nature's ability to contribute food and fresh water to a growing human population is being compromised in every region on Earth. Nature underpins all economies with the free services it provides in the form of clean water, air and the pollination of all major human food crops by bees and insects. In the Americas, this is said to total more than $24 trillion a year. The pollination of crops by bees and other animals alone is worth up to $577 billion. Uh, there are some very uh, advanced mathematics that enable people to come to uh, those valuations, and one has to question the extent to which um, you can really put monetary values on nature. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives an indication of the extent to which we are um, dependent on nature. But um, notice how quickly he comes to the subject of economics when he starts with a description of what is happening to the natural world in the present time. This is advance notice of a study that's to be published in about six weeks. So that's one aspect. Um, some more hard facts, just to cheer things along. The World Health Organization uh, uh, reports that mental disorders affect at least one in five people across the globe, at least for some time during their lifetime. The World Bank tells us, um, and this was only in October of last year, half the world's population, 3.4 billion people, struggle to meet basic needs. The bank reports that economic advances around the world mean that while fewer people live in extreme poverty, almost half the world's population, 3.4 billion people, still struggle to meet basic needs. It reports that living on less than $3.20 per day reflects poverty lines in lower middle income countries, while $5.50 a day reflects standards in upper-middle-income countries. And the World Bank is committed to achieving the goal of ending extreme poverty, defined as living on less than $1.90 a day, by 2030. It reports that the share of the world's population living in extreme poverty fell to 10% in 2015, but the pace of extreme poverty reduction has slowed since then. So there's some good news. It's uh, going down, but not quickly. However, this is still the World Bank. Given that economic growth means that a much greater proportion of the world's poor now live in wealthier countries, additional poverty lines and a broader understanding of poverty are crucial to, to fully fighting it. Well, perhaps that's simple enough. Um, but again, it comes very quickly to the subject of economics in the context of uh, uh, significant uh, difficulties for human beings. Now, the reason people come to economics and the response of economics, um, the whole science of economics, the whole academy, if you like, of economics, the way we consider economics, um, is very important in how we address these problems, and I would go further and say in how these problems came into being in the first place. Um, and let me give you an illustration about what I mean. Uh, and It really comes to what we understand by economics and what is the scope and purpose of the subject of economics. 
Uh, I looked at a, a very basic economics textbook. It's called Basic Economics. It's now in its fifth edition. Uh, that was published in 2015 by a man called Thomas Sowell. And it's a widely used foundation economics textbook um, in, in um, colleges and schools, I suppose, uh, across the globe. In the introduction, there is a very brief paragraph about paradise, the Garden of Eden, in which it points out that there are plenty of resources and few demands. And then it goes on as follows. Without scarcity, there is no reason to economise, and therefore no economics. A distinguished British economist named Lionel Robbins gave a classic definition of economics. Economics is the study of the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses. Then, under the heading scarcity, still in the introduction, he says, what does scarce mean? It means that what everybody wants adds up to more than there is. Regardless, he says, regardless of our policies, practices or institutions, whether they are wise or unwise, noble or ignoble, there is simply not enough to go around to satisfy all our desires to the fullest. Unmet needs are inherent in these circumstances, whether we have a capitalist, socialist, feudal or other kind of economy. Life does not ask us what we want. It presents us with options. Economics is one of the ways of trying to make the most of these options. Now, I was interested in that because there is that um, phrase, there is simply not enough to go around to satisfy all our desires to the fullest. And then the next sentence begins, unmet needs as though the satisfaction of all our desires are translated into needs. And the implication, it seems to me, is that the purpose of economics, considered thus, is to meet everybody's unsatisfied desires. And I would respectfully submit that that is an impossible task. But it calls into question, where have all these unsatisfied desires come from? Why are they there? And is there any way of actually dealing with that side of the problem? And you have to look through, well, you look in vain through economics textbooks, in my experience, to find any discussion of that side of the problem. What is the source of human desire? Is satisfying desire the whole purpose of human life? If not, what is? And how do you deal with it? And uh, there is, isn't there, um, implicit in that an idea of what it is to be human. You could sum it up in, the, in these terms as um, what it is to be human is to be a bundle of desires that need to be satisfied. <laughs> All right? Uh, I, I, I know one laughs when it's actually sort of out there on the table, but just think a minute. How many of us have found in the course of the day that we have unsatisfied desires that we would like to be satisfied? Sometimes regardless of any other consideration. It's, it, it is, um, I think, implicit in that description, a view of what it is to be human. And a discussion of what it is to be human is therefore absolutely vital to addressing what we now call economic problems. I think I would go on to say, they're not really just economic problems, they're human problems. And um, we've maintained in the school, really since the inception, that economics is essentially a human study, which is how, or one of the reasons, at least why, the school came to be so interested in philosophy and in due course to um, discover um, and try to put into practice the philosophy of unity that I referred to earlier. 
Now, that particular definition of economics, although widely known, is not uncontroversial, even amongst conventional economists. Uh, Alfred Marshall, one of the great uh, economists of the 19th century, wrote a, a book on the principles of economics, which was studied and was really the basis of economic studies for um, at least 50 years up until the 1920s. He described it as the study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. If you could turn mankind into humanity, uh, the study of humanity in the ordinary business of life is, I think, a much more interesting and inspiring uh, description of the subject. But again, you look through the textbooks um, in vain for a study of humanity, of what it is to be human. It's all about how people earn a living and, uh, and that sort of thing. But it doesn't ask those very fundamental questions about why people earn a living, why they go out to work, what the life is for, and how the arrangements that people make for themselves and their communities actually address what a human being is and could be. In the school, um, we've adopted um, and have done since the school's inception a description of economics, uh, which is simply a study of natural laws governing relations between people in society. Uh, that seems to be quite a useful definition. It also brings people into the picture and I hope invites um, some consideration of what people are and what governs them. And I put, this, I put all this before you because the argument really is that the concept of what we are as human beings is causal. It's what makes us do the things we do. Our understanding of being human is what directs the way we conduct our lives. It directs our aspirations, our hopes, our fears. It directs our expectations for our children and future generations. It's absolutely central, isn't it, what we actually think we are. Uh, and it's a question which often goes um, unconsidered um, and certainly is largely unconsidered in the whole field of, um, a, 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 that we call economics. But I, I, I suggest that it may not be the only thing, but it's pretty central. So what does it mean? Um, well, the uh, title promises um, a view of, the, um, uh, of uh, human nature in our time. It's always easy to generalise. Well, perhaps it's not always easy to generalise, but I'm going to generalise. And one has to recognise that within generalities there are inevitable exceptions. But there is a, a modern ph a philosophic view um, based on, on, on the, um, the scientific revolution that started with philosophers like uh, Francis Bacon, René Descartes uh, and Thomas Hobbes which leads to the view, which I think is prevalent in modern culture, that the body, for a human being, the body is the only reality. We are our bodies. When I say I am, I mean this is. And that's a view which is kind of pervades the way we look at the world. That the body, the material, is the only reality. And a very great deal of modern science is directed to supporting that view or derives from that view. I know I speak in generalisations, but I don't think I speak unfairly because I'm talking about a sort of underlying culture that frames the way as populations, as people, not necessarily as individuals, but as, as a people, it frames the way we look at and respond to the world unless we take quite serious efforts to look at it in some other way. And one of the results of that is the view that individual satisfaction, individual freedom, are legitimate final ends. 
And along with that philosophy that uh, had its birth um, with those philosophers I, I referred to, um, comes a view that to be, uh, to be human is to be simply an individual. And the primary consideration then becomes the individual and the uh, preservation, as it were, of the individual. And so now we have individual human rights, um, the primacy of the individual in most kinds of modern thought. Uh, and that, of course, is to the detriment of any sense of the human being as a political being, as a member of a community and a family, and perhaps as a member of humanity as a whole. Now, I suppose the good news is that... Uh, the view of what it is to be human is something which uh, changes over time. It hasn't always, for example, been the view that we were just this body. Other cultures have understood differently. The question um, or the direction to know thyself remains a pertinent direction for all generations, it seems to me, through all time. And we have to keep asking this question who am I? What am I doing here? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of a, a human life? Now, an alternative view of what it is to be human recognises a completely different dimension, the dimension of being. And after all, we still refer to ourselves as human beings and raises inevitably the question, uh, well, what do we mean by being? Um, a question which it is extremely difficult to answer. And certainly, uh, I'm not really going to try to answer it uh, in this lecture. Uh, what, what I can say is that through the study and practice of philosophy um, over many years, one comes to the conclusion that this body is not all that there is that there are other realms of experience. And I'm particularly interested at the moment in two other realms of experience, what I call the mind, what I think is probably generally known as the mind, and what is helpfully, I think, known of as spirit or being, which is not the mind. I am not just what I think, because there's something in me that knows that I think. And I find an inquiry into what it is that knows that I think endlessly fascinating. And a great deal of philosophy is spent in just that inquiry. And it's an inquiry that, um, in a way, it can't be discursive. It's an inquiry that brings the mind to an increasing quiet until there is experience of just being. And funnily enough, most people have some experience of just being, however fleeting it may be, and it's a very contented place to be, if I can put it that way. It's a very contented condition. It's associated with peace and joy and um, experience of that kind. Just being oneself. And the human mind is capable of going there. But it does seem also that the general state of a human being is to actually live in this kind of middle world between the material and um, the what I'll call the spiritual, the realm of being. And that's this vast realm of mind in which we think, in which we discriminate, in which we consider in which we love and uh, feel all forms of affection and uh, disaffection. That whole wonderful world, um, which really makes up the, a, a great deal of human experience. There may be some of you, uh, one or two around, who are old enough to remember songs that were current in the 1960s. 
and there was a Frenchman called Sacha de Stel who used to sing, What are the thoughts that surround you when you're alone in your bed? And that phrase kind of stuck in my mind, you know. What are the thoughts that surround you when you're alone in your bed? Um, one thing I am going to say is I am not going to answer that question in a public audience. <laughs> But what I can say is that, um, at least until I go to sleep, I am surrounded by thoughts. And unless um, I make quite significant efforts, that is true of most of the waking day as well. Some of those thoughts I summon deliberately and carefully. Some I cultivate through reading and reflection and all, all sorts of things like that. And some seem to come quite arbitrarily out of nowhere. Um, but I also find that within this realm of mind there is a capacity to discriminate between these thoughts. Some of those thoughts I recognise as this isn't me, I don't think this. Some of them I identify with very quickly. I agree with that. Um, others I think are good ideas or bad ideas but there's a faculty in the mind that is able to kind of sort them all out and occasionally there's a voice in the mind that says enough is enough, do just be quiet and sometimes the mind is obedient even to that now what, what this is telling us isn't it, is that the human being has a faculty of mind which is able to discriminate. It's able to decide. It's able to direct. It has what you might call the power of will. We can decide to follow this course of action and not that course of action. We can prefer one thing to another. Um, and this faculty, this um, ability that we have, gives us a faculty which I think you could call self-governance we are able to control our actions, decide what to do and what not to do. We are able, to some extent, to control our thoughts. We are certainly able to decide what we approve and what we don't approve. And this leads to a picture, which I think is accurate, of a human being, at least potentially, as being a self-governing entity. Now, um, I kind of stress this point because we tend in this age to depend a great deal on being governed. One of the reasons why I think um, we feel the, this country is in, in major crisis at the moment is that we're not exactly sure how we're going to be governed or who by or where from. Isn't that what the discussion is all about? And it's not entirely clear at the moment how that is going to resolve itself. But under, underlying it is an expectation that we're going to be governed from somewhere outside ourselves, isn't there? Um, in the same way, I'm a practicing lawyer and I've practiced in, in the courts for uh, many years and uh, you see the same thing. There is a general expectation that somehow or other the courts are going to resolve our difficulties that justice will be dispensed by the courts, that law is something that comes to us from outside. But this different, I think, different view, or this alternative view of being human, it stresses that actually we're capable of governing ourselves. This is nothing new. It was known to the ancient world. It's known in the uh, Eastern philosophies and religions. Um, it's a well-known view, it just doesn't happen to be prevalent in our communities, certainly at the present time. Uh, I, I, I would like to argue that uh, it's actually quite important in the present time that we recover this capacity and understanding of us as human beings as self-governing entities. But we're not just individual, independent self-governing entities. What one notices is that within this world of mind, we also have this capacity to communicate and share with others. It starts with families, 
it extends to uh, friends and wider communities, and it can open up uh, to all our social arrangements, including the way that we agree to govern ourselves um, amongst ourselves. So that um, the human being, uh, well, the, the next observation is that a human being is greatly enriched by this association. That somehow one is more human in company than one is on one's own. And I think for the practical business of daily life, uh, that's a rather important consideration. What we're reduced to by the view of the human being as um, uh, uh, really nothing more than a body is um, that social arrangements are nothing more than a necessary agreement to make it possible to go on living without being threatened by everybody else. The assumption which um, um, is said to originate from Thomas Hobbes' view of life as na nasty, what is it, nasty, short, nasty, brutish, something in short, um, is that the, that is human nature. Solitary, isn't it? Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, I think, was the, his description of um, the natural condition of a human being. Uh, that was a new idea in his time. And, you know, there's quite a lot of human history to arrive at that conclusion that managed without it, and with a very different conception of what it is to be human. But from that conception comes the idea of a social contract, an idea that... Um, Really, there is no objective law, but we just have to decide for ourselves how we're going to live as harmoniously as possible uh, and make the best of ourselves. And the individual uh, becomes um, basically a predator on everybody else. A different view is that we are actually part of a huge organism and that we are totally dependent on everybody else and that without everybody else, we wouldn't be here either. We wouldn't have a sense of existence of our own. In Africa, I met the, 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 the philosophy of Ubuntu. Ubuntu um, is not really a sort of um, articulated philosophy in the way that we are accustomed to in the West, but it is an outlook on life which basically says, because you are, I am. And you see this. Um, we went round some communities a while ago um, which were in quite difficult circumstances. They didn't have enough food, so people were hungry. It was, um, you know, what you could see that life was uh, very hard for people. But when, they met, when, when you arrived, you were greeted with a smile and often with songs. Uh, it's quite astonishing. You arrive, you turn up, you get off this little coach thing and a group of ladies stand up and start singing a welcome. Uh, because the arrival of the stranger is an affirmation of their existence. And the greeting is an affirmation of the existence of the stranger. And it's a mutual thing. And it creates an immediate harmony and an immediate meeting place. Which again is enriching for both parties. And it seems to me that that's an attitude which um, we could usefully um, harness and develop in all social arrangements. That even the stranger is welcome. But the stranger needs to be and needs to conduct himself in a way which is welcome. Now, All, all of that is really an attempt, at least, to map out, to describe a kind of human being who doesn't really enter into our economic considerations when we talk about how economics really works. And it's um, intended to underline the central importance of mind and therefore of what we think and how we think of ourselves. A related proposition is this. 
It seems to me that everybody has a philosophy of life. Not everybody sits down and thinks, what is my philosophy of life? Not everybody um, works out for themselves what their philosophy of life is. But one way or another, everybody has one, because it is the way they look at things, whether they've thought about it or not. Uh, uh, to give you an example, um, when I first came to London, um, I was uh, about 21 years old. I got a job in an insurance company, and I, got, I didn't know anybody in London. I came here uh, on my own. And uh, so the first people I met were my work colleagues, and they were the first social circle I came across. And the office where I'd been for, I suppose, eight or nine months, certainly not more than a year, was closed down by the very large company that it was part of. It's a large insurance company, one of the very big insurance companies. And uh, one of the people in, in, um, in the office where I worked was the son of one of the directors of the company. Um, and so uh, he had a very uh, good opinion of himself <laughs> and felt it, um, we had a f leaving due, and he, he thought it would be appropriate to give me some friendly advice um, before we went our separate ways. He went off to one office, I went off to another, and he said to me, the thing for you is look after number one. <laughs> right? One simple sentence, look after number one. And I thought, well, um, this incident was before I'd even started studying or thinking about philosophy. But I thought, there's a complete philosophy of life in that sentence. And uh, people's philosophies of lives are, can be as simple as that. And it behoves us, I think, to have a rather careful look at these sort of ideas that trip off the tongue so easily, because they have consequences. Um, looking after number one, you can imagine, I don't, um, don't have time actually to spell it out, um, but it would inevitably have, com uh, have consequences. The community or the family or the nation is more important than you are is another idea, isn't it? And it would create a different outlook. I'm not necessarily suggesting you just sort of swallow that hole and say, oh yes, we're going to think like that now. What I do ask you to do is to think, well, actually, how do I approach things like that? What, you know, what, what, what do I, as a human being, how, how, how do I actually approach that? Because the way that a community looks at things is only um, a, 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 an accumulation of the way the people in it look at them. That's what a culture actually is. It's the ideas that people generally share. Um, and we have a choice about that. So your question is, the question I have for you is, well, what is, what is your philosophy of life? What alternative philosophy of life is there that might influence the world in which we live in a different way? So, for example, when we look at the natural world, do we think, ah, oh, I can exploit that, I can sell all those trees to those people over there, I, all I have to do is chop them down and take them there. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Or do we say, that tree is astounding, and the only reason I can breathe is because it's there. And if it wasn't, I couldn't. And does that not change the way you look at the tree? and the forest, and the way that you deal with it. And so we have to go on questioning all the time how we relate. And the urgent need um, is to, uh, or an urgent need in the present time is, is just that, isn't it? To ask ourselves, how do we really relate to the natural world? Because as, as pointed out um, by Mr. Vidal in that essay, we're, we're, we're utterly dependent on it. Now, our views of economics also embed, as it were, into our economic life the ideas that we have 
about our relationship to the world, about our relationships to each other. Um, and I asked myself, well, what philosophy is embedded in the economic arrangements of our time? There was, for example, in, 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 in the um, text that I read out at the beginning, the aim of life is to satisfy our desires. And it's kind of embedded in the way we think about economics. It's there in the textbook. The whole point is to satisfy desires, and there aren't the resources to satisfy everybody's desires. Therefore, economics is about scarcity, not about how to control those desires. But I hope what I've said about the way the mind can work and is also shows that actually we have some choice about the extent to which we satisfy desires. There's another thing that's embedded in, in, in modern economic thinking, um, and that is that happiness comes from material satisfaction. Now, there are studies in recent years which are, are showing that actually that is, has, that's a principle that has only very limited application. It is true that if people don't have enough to eat and do not have adequate shelter, then um, life can be pretty miserable. And there is a need to make sure that that level of material provision is there. And of course the economy needs to provide for that. But the studies seem to show that um, while that is true up to a certain level, once people do have adequate nourishment and are properly clothed and able to live with a, a measure of simple dignity, um, what actually satisfies people has nothing to do with the material world. And of course, uh, out of that um, comes the whole flowering of family life, community life, um, connection with nature, music, art, literature, sport, all of those things, which um, do so much more to actually enrich human life than having a little bit more breakfast or you know, meeting, the, meeting the most material needs to excess. Uh, and by excess, I mean more than is actually necessary for uh, simple maintenance. It would be different, wouldn't it, if we saw the purpose of human life as being to flourish as a human being in a flourishing environment. And the flourishing of a human being meant not just the ever-increasing acquisition of material wealth, or the ever-increasing satisfaction of material desires, but the actual flowering of a human being in the stature that a human being can reach to in terms of wisdom and understanding, in terms of the capacity to love and to share and to serve. All of those things are aspects of being human. All of them would have and can have and do have um, significant economic impacts and understanding the importance of that in um, bringing about the flourishing of a human being seems to me to be absolutely central to dealing with the major problems that uh, the economic world, what we call the economic world, um, faces at the present time. The answers don't really lie in the sort of thinking that caused the problem as Einstein uh, observed. It's not an original observation. But the question is, what, is, what sort of alternative thinking would help? And the suggestion, at least, is that the way we think about ourselves, if adapted, would make a change. And an understanding of human flourishing in terms of the cultivation of the finer aspects of mind and understanding, and perhaps the ability to reach into this world of pure being would be a very different way of organizing human life than is common in the present time. So then, well, what is the place, the human place in, in the natural world? Again, first of all, one comes back to the philosophy of unity. It's not that there is the human world and the natural world, 
as human beings, it's perfectly possible to recognise that we're actually an integral part of the natural world. And it's not just that the natural world provides the free services that were being referred to in that article earlier. It's uh, There is actually an interactive process. It seems to me, at least, that it's perfectly rational to say, well, or to ask, if we human beings are so dependent on this natural world, what is our proper um, approach to it? We're part of it. We can't escape it. I challenge you to stop breathing till I finish this lecture, and you'll find just how closely associated we are with the natural world and the trees that produce the air that we breathe. We're, we're integrated. We're part of it. And... Um, you can't therefore say, well, it's there for us to exploit, or it's just there for us to exploit. It is a fact that it sustains human life, but what about the human aspect? Is there not a duty of care towards the natural world? Because after all, as human beings, we have this capacity to care, don't we? And to choose whether or not to care. So, that's the first term, thing, the human place in the natural world. Um, I like the term friends of the earth. And it's very different, isn't it, uh, from exploiters of the earth. You may think you wish more for your friends than you wish for yourself. Certainly in the outlook that I'm trying to convey as being um, at least an acceptable, even desirable way of understanding what it is to be human. We could see ourselves, if you like, as citizens of the universe, members of a vast universe with a role within it, not outside it, part of it, a contributory factor to its whole existence. Possibly, just possibly, the human function or part of the human function is to understand it or at least to try to understand it. Because, after all, we have this faculty of understanding. Uh, we can't produce oxygen like the trees do, but we can understand the whole process and the whole cycle which enables us to breathe and live. And that, in a way, would turn us into being servants of all things rather than masters of all things. I think it was Francis Bacon who advanced the modern scientific project on the basis that human understanding could reach the point where nature could be completely subdued. I think those were approximately were Bacon's words. And the whole modern scientific project uh, flowed from, again, more or less a sentence spoken by a philosopher. Incidentally, if anyone can explain to me why one particular set of ideas spoken by one or two philosophers gained so much command over the human mind for so long, please have a word with me afterwards. <laughs> um, but the fact is, as far as we can see, they do. And it's probably to do with um, being able to articulate what is already present in the mind whether it's wise or foolish. And one or two people just happen to articulate it in a way that catches fire. So what, what then are, are the consequences for economics in all this? I think the first thing to say is it cannot be separated from philosophy. We have to ask these basic questions about what it means to be human and how we relate to the world in order to be able to direct our economic activity in a way that is for the best for human and all other forms of life. It means that in considering the whole world of work, which economists get very um, uh, concerned with, the purpose has to be understood to be the all-round flourishing of the human being and of the world around us. And I venture to suggest, and uh, I'll give you an example in a moment, that that would actually make a big difference to the way we run businesses, the way we go to work, the way we treat working life, uh, uh, and all the rest. 
I think it would mean that education and economics would start with self-knowledge. And I don't think it would just be a chapter in the book. I think it would be the first half of the book. And then you might go on to say, well, now we've got some idea of what we are as human beings, we can see how we relate to everything else. Um, in a way, when I say it cannot be separated from philosophy, um, perhaps it means the end of economics altogether. Although I'm quite sure that um, some of the insights of economics would still be extremely useful in business studies um, and areas of that kind. And of course the question then, uh, people always ask, so I'll try and deal with the question straight away, well is any of this practical? Um, I think it's practical. Uh, first of all, one recognises that people everywhere are governed by ideas. So it must be practical to share ideas and try to express ideas and try to come to some agreement as to what are good ideas and what are not good ideas. And that form of understanding then plays itself out very simply into the practical world. Um, <clears throat> about ten years ago now, um, I was very briefly a director of a company uh, which is run by the school, um, which operates a garden centre at Waterbury in Oxfordshire. And I was interested for that reason in how companies are governed and managed, and I was given by somebody a book, and it was called Let My People Go Surfing. Let My People Go Surfing was written by a man called Yvonne Chuenard, who was the founding inspiration, and I think still is, the inspiration of a company called Patagonia Inc. Patagonia Inc. Um, is a fun company. Um, they, make, um, they make products for outdoor sports. He started off, he couldn't get, he, he was a very keen rock climber and he couldn't get carabiners that were strong enough and properly designed for the kind of climbing he wanted to do. So he went to a blacksmith and he got him to make one. And then people said, where can I get one of those? And he said, I'll give you a hand. And he ended up with an international company which deals in quality sports goods of all kinds. Carabiners, ropes, surfboards, um, and uh, very chic outdoor clothing. Um, uh, expensive, but very good quality. And in this book, Let My People Go Surfing, uh, he says, remember this. He says this. Remember, he says, work has to be fun. We value employees who live rich and rounded lives. We run a flexible workplace and we have ever since we were a blacksmith shop that shut down whenever the waves were six feet hot and glassy. I gather that's what surfers like. Our policy has always allowed employees to work flexible hours as long as the work gets done with no negative impacts on others. A serious surfer doesn't plan to go surfing next Tuesday at two o'clock. You go surfing when there are waves and the tide and wind are right. Now, I quite like that because um, it implies, doesn't it, a connection with the natural world and being directed by it, apart from anything else, even if only for fun. And fun is important. Then uh, he, he went on... Um, talking about his company and how it worked, he says, to confront the elephant in the room, growth-dependent capitalism. Um, one of the effects of um, this uh, philosophy of economics, that it is there to meet endless desires, is that the whole economic system becomes dependent on producing more and more and more to meet endless desires. And that's the elephant in the room. Growth-dependent capitalism. 
Patagonia will promote the concept that everyone must learn to consume less and use resources far more productively, as well as innovate as quickly and ingeniously as possible to reduce adverse human impact on the natural systems that support all life. So that's a simple attitude which he built into his company's policy and practice. reduce adverse human impact on the natural system that support all life. He says, the concept at the very heart of Patagonia's business is to manufacture, repair and recycle products in order that they last a lifetime. And the reason why the company is to be presented with the Accenture Strategy Award for Circular Economy uh, multinational at the World Economic Forum in, in Davos, Switzerland, this week. It wasn't this week, actually. I think it was in 2013. Um, but there was that concept at the heart to recycle products so they last a lifetime. Is why they got this award. To co coincide with the award, the company is announcing the launch of an e-commerce platform for its worn wear initiative which will sell used Patagonia clothing and equipment online sourced from its customers. So it's actually setting itself up in competition with itself to sell second-hand goods that it produced in the first place. <laughs> now, that is a very different attitude, isn't it, um, to um, the ordinary demands of, or the ordinary way we look at how to run a business. And I, 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 I mention it because it indicates that it is actually possible to approach things with a different mindset, with different ideas, and you get different outcomes. Um, he, he writes, the so-called circular economy, when applied to fashion, is a system whereby everything in the process of making garments, including the garments themselves, is reused or recycled, a rejection of the more traditional take, make and dispose model, in which products are cheaply made, consumed voraciously, then disposed. Uh, I, I like the reference to the circular economy because the school's been teaching about a cycle of production, um, I think, since its inception in 1937. But it's an idea which has taken hold uh, really in the last 20 years or so. The whole idea of the circular economy, writes another business consultant, is creating no waste. There should be no end of life of anything. Nothing should just sit in landfill. Well, of course, uh, those ideas are now coming to the fore and are now being practised and are again an illustration of how the way we see things and the way we relate to things can change. And we have the opportunity at all times to consider how it is we look at things and how they might change, and how they might change for the better. And it seems to me that in the teaching of economics, it is essential to teach that very understanding. That human life is not just a set pattern which has to happen and nobody can do anything about. We have choices. We are able to choose. We are able to master ourselves. Um, so that really is, is, is the message. Um, I was asking myself, well, wh what would I want the chapters in the economics textbooks to say about human being and labour? I hope that what I said this evening gives an indication of what could be said in textbooks about what it is to be human. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. I think probably it's time we had some refreshment. You've been extremely patient. Um, so we'll stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you.